Are we living in the last days? It's hard not to think of it as a possibility. Considering all the chaos and rapid change that's taken place in the past few years. With wars, pandemics, economic uncertainties, government controlled mandates, neighbors warring neighbors, the loss of truth, still, none of these crises can tell us for certain. Even Jesus said to his disciples, when they asked him when the end is to come, he said, And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you're not alarmed, for this must take place, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. And there will be famines and earthquakes in various places. All these are but the beginning of the birth pains. But what if we could know the answer to whether we are living in the last days? What if there was proof? And that proof has been right in front of us for thousands of years. In the book Signature of God, written by well-known author and teacher Grant Jeffrey, it points out that an ancient prophecy in the book of Ezekiel may give us the answer. In his book, he writes that this ancient prediction details the exact timing of the rebirth of the nation of Israel in 1948, which according to most biblical scholars is a signature sign of the last days. Now before I jump into this prophecy, we need to understand why it's so important to biblical prophecy that the Jews would return to their homeland. For one, God promised Abraham nearly 4,000 years ago that he and his descendants would inherit the land of Israel. For example, in Genesis chapter 13 verse 15 it says, For all the land which thou seest to thee will I give it, and to thy seed forever. In addition, Israel was chosen by God for a purpose, to be a blessing to the nations. In fact, in Genesis chapter 12 verse 3 it says, I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you I will curse and all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. You see, it would be through Israel that the Messiah would eventually come and provide salvation to all. And this occurred when Jesus lived, died, and rose again on the third day. However, that wasn't the end of it. Since the Jews did not accept Jesus, God allowed Israel to fall and he scattered the Israelites across the globe after the Roman siege of Jerusalem in AD 70. Now this was at a time when Jesus' disciples had been spreading the gospel to the nations. Just as God said it would be when he promised Abraham that it would be through his people that all would be blessed. And while the Israelites lost their nation in 70 AD, God promised to bring them back one day. And that day occurred 2,000 years later on May 15, 1948. The amazing thing is, the odds were stacked against this outcome. First of all, history has shown us that all of the great nations throughout history have come and gone some longer than others, but none have ever rose again. Not until Israel did, in 1948, after 2,000 years since its fall in AD 70, and 2,600 years since Israel had not been under subjugation by any outside government. Secondly, the land now known as Israel had long been a place of conflict, like it still is today, but other nations fought over this land through the generations including the Egyptians, Amalekites, Midianites, Moabites, Romans, and countless others. Even before Israel's exile from their land, the nation had always been persecuted by its neighbors. Whether it was the king of Assyria, Haman, Hitler, or Rouhani, the president of Iran, attempts to completely destroy Israel have come and gone, always failing. That is a miracle in and of itself. But when we dive deep into the scriptures, we find something even more amazing. Ezekiel's prophecy. The book of Ezekiel was written by a prophet of God between 593 and 565 BC during the Babylonian captivity of the Jews when the Israelites were driven out of their promised land and forced to live among the Babylonians. According to the Bible, God drove them out and used the Babylonians to enact his judgment. Why? Because the Israelites began to follow the ways of the surrounding nations with idolatry, paganism, and other sinful ways. So Ezekiel, by means of his prophetic ministry, he attempted to bring them back to repentance and to confidence in the distant future. Now this is where we pick up in the book of Ezekiel and find a prophecy that perhaps shows we are living in the end times and Jesus' is coming is imminent. His first vision occurred four years after Nebuchadnezzar deported the first group of Judean exiles to Babylon. But the thing is, that deportation was prophesied years earlier by the prophet Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapter 25 verse 11 reads, This whole land will be a desolation and a horror, 
and these nations will serve the king of Babylon 70 years. Both secular history and the Bible reveal that, as predicted, the Babylonian captivity ended exactly 70 years later in the spring of 536 BC. But only a small remnant of Jews chose to leave Babylon and return to Jerusalem. The vast majority were happy to remain in the Persian Empire. Ezekiel was given a new revelation, revealing how long it would be until the Jewish people would finally reestablish their nation. In Ezekiel chapter 4 verse 3 it reads, Then get yourself an iron plate and set it up as an iron wall between you and the city, and set your face toward it so that it is under siege, and besiege it. This is a sign to the house of Israel. For you, lie down on your left side, and lay the iniquity of the house of Israel on it. You shall bear their iniquity for the number of days that you lie on it. For I have assigned you a number of days corresponding to the years of their iniquity, three hundred and ninety days. Thus you shall bear the iniquity of the house of Israel. When you have completed these, you shall lie down a second time, but on your right side, and bear the iniquity of the house of Judah. I have assigned it to you forty days, a day for each year. In the passage, Ezekiel clearly declares that this prophecy will be assigned to the house of Israel, and each day represents one biblical year. The prediction revealed that Israel would be punished for a combined total of 430 years. According to Grant Jeffrey's calculation, the starting point is the spring of 536 BC, or 536.4 BC. So God decreed to Israel a period of punishment of 430 years, however, they had already had 70 years of punishment during the Babylonian exile. There still remained 360 years of punishment. So 360 years later, nothing happened. God did not restore the land to them, so did he lie? Actually, quite the contrary. See, both the Bible and history reveal that Israel did not repent of its sins at the end of the 70 year captivity. So then what did God do? Well, the solution to the mystery of the duration of Israel's worldwide dispersion and return was actually revealed to Moses in Leviticus chapter 26. You see, God declares to Israel four times in this passage that if, after being punished for her sins, if she still did not repent, the punishments previously specified would be multiplied by seven. Let's take a look. In Leviticus chapter 26, verse 18, it says, If also after these things you do not obey me, then I will punish you seven times more for your sins. Further down in verse 21 it says, If then you act with hostility against me, and are unwilling to obey me, I will increase the plague on you seven times according to your sins. And in verse 24 it says, Then I will act with hostility against you, and I, even I, will strike you seven times for your sins. You know what? As we can see, Israel was unrepentant. This means that Israel would be without an independent nation for many more years. But to solve this mystery, we have to understand that biblical years are measured in 360 days, unlike our calendar, which is not 365 days, but 365.25 days. So if we take 360 years times 7, which is the amount of punishment that God decreed in Leviticus, we get 2,520 biblical years. When we multiply 2,520 times 360 days, According to the prophecy, we get 907,200 days. Now to convert that to our modern calendar, we must divide by 365.25 days. That calculates to 2,483.8 years. Now finally we take that number and we subtract 536.4 BC, which was the start of the prophecy, we get 1947.4. Wait. But that's not the year that Israel became a nation. It was 1948. Well, that's because we must adjust for the fact that there is no year zero between BC and AD. So we must add one more year, which brings us to 1948.4, which would be May 1948, or according to Grant Jeffrey's further calculations, May 15th, 1948, the day the British mandate officially ended and Israel became an independent nation. It boggles my mind how precise the Bible is in prophecy. And even more so, it boggles my mind how people don't see it. That this is impossible to do unless it comes from the Word of God. And amazing as this prophecy is, what does it mean in regard to the end times? Well, for this, we turn to the words of Jesus, specifically in Matthew chapter 24, verse 3. 
And it says, As he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately, saying, Tell us, when will these things be, and what will be the sign of your coming, and of the end of the age? He answers, See that no one leads you astray. For many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and they will lead many astray. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not alarmed, for this must take place, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. And there will be famines and earthquakes in various places. All these are but the beginning of birth pains. Then further on in the chapter, Jesus describes how we can know when these things will happen. He says in Matthew 24, 32, From the fig tree learn its lesson. As soon as its branches become tender and puts out its leaves, you know that summer is near. So also when you see all these things, you know that he is near at the very gates. Truly I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. Many believe Jesus is referring to Israel as the fig tree in this passage, and that when Israel blooms or returns as a thriving nation, then we know we are living in the final generation. For example, Dr. Elmer Town, a college and seminary professor and author, says, It should be understood by those studying the prophecies of Christ's second coming, that the preeminent sign that Christ gave for the closeness of his return was that of the budding fig tree. The fig tree is the well-known symbol of Israel nationally. To those observing the nation Israel today, it will be noted that large numbers of Jewish immigrants are returning to Palestine. Thus, the fig tree is putting forth its green leaves and thereby proclaiming the near return of Christ. But how can we be sure that Jesus is referring to Israel as the fig tree when he doesn't actually mention Israel in his answer? How can we then use this parable as a sign of the end? For one, we can look at other scriptures to help us determine this. For example, in Matthew 21 when Jesus cursed the fig tree, the scripture reads, In the morning as he was returning to the city, he became hungry. And seeing a fig tree by the wayside, he went to it and found nothing on it but leaves. And he said to it, May no fruit ever come from you again. And the fig tree withered at once. According to renowned theologian Matthew Henry, this represents the state of the nation and people of the Jews in particular. Our Lord Jesus found among them nothing but leaves, and after they rejected Christ, blindness and hardness grew upon them, till they were undone and their place and nation rooted up. Like this fig tree, Israel was not yielding fruit and was a nation of many professing to be followers of God. So Jesus commanded judgment on that particular tree to never grow fruit again as a sign to Israel, whom he also condemned. But God, in his loving character, will one day see to it that Israel returns to him because of the covenant he made with Abraham thousands of years ago. Even more so, throughout the Old Testament, Israel is described as God's vineyard or tree or plant. Basically, all ancient Israelites, who were largely agrarian, knew the first fruits of the harvest belonged to God, and that notion helped them to conceptualize their relationship to Him. And though Israel's fruitfulness can only come from God, it is when Israel returns to God and is no longer in rebellion that the nation will once again produce fruit. I believe that we can absolutely be certain that Christ was referring to Israel as the fig tree, and when combined with Ezekiel's prophecy detailing the exact day when Israel will return as a nation, we can be confident that summer is near, and perhaps we are living in the final generation before Christ's return. Take care and God bless.